live on the internet. It's like magic. You know? <laughs> How you doing, Johnny? I'm doing great, Eric. Awesome. So for the uh, the three people who watch this who don't know who Johnny is, uh, Johnny Johnson is the, the the founder, right, of Blue Buoy. You started it, or did you? Oh, you, actually, you're that's started something, right? I've been around long enough. People think I am, but I yeah. actually swam at Blue Boy as an 11 year old when I. Oh, that's there. right. Yep. So I've had quite a journey there. Started as a swimmer on their little swim team, and became a teacher in 1967. Okay. My wife and I bought in as a partner in 1977, and about 12, 15 years ago, we bought out the partners. So it's been an amazing journey from student, teacher, partner to owner over some 55 years. Were you related to the original owners at all, or you just knew them for swimming there? No, my mom was actually friends with a mother of one of the their star swimmers, and okay. that was the connection. My first summer there, we lost my dad in Vietnam. He was killed in 1967, in fact, 51 years ago yesterday. Oh, wow. And the owner, Mel, who was the swim coach for me, sort of took me under wing when I started teaching, and it was a, a long, incredible journey. He was an incredible mentor, Mel Maxwell. Nice. My, my dad also served in Vietnam. Um, he was a, a long range patrol in a, a combat division and uh, yeah, led a little team in the, in the jungle there, you know, so. Tough times, but yeah, I know a lot of people didn't come back, so he was fortunate, you know. Uh, he, he says the reason he didn't, he, the reason he made it back was because he hated running. So he would just find a good spot and stay there. That, that, that kind of worked out for him. Yeah. But uh, he, was, he was a bad runner. But uh, but yeah, so you also at one point were the, uh, the president of the NDPA of the National Drowning Prevention Alliance, and you started the the Safer Three campaign, um, safer pools, safer water, safer kids, which has been adopted by tons of places. Um, and you know you've just had a, a really fantastic history in water safety, and I think it's it's commendable, honestly. You know. Well, thank you. Yeah, it's kind of goes with the, the territory, you know, teaching swimming is a, a main component of water safety pre and preventive prevention measures. And it really opened our eyes though, in meeting groups like the Orange County Drowning Prevention Network, which later became the basis for the National Drowning Prevention Alliance and realized that swim lessons alone are not the answer. It's a combination of so many factors, so many things. Yeah, um, you know, we coined my my dad really coined in 1987 the the phrase layers of protection. He put it in writing for the first time in 1989 in a, a book he wrote um, called uh, Summertime Fun Year Round Danger um, Swimming Pools. You know how you can lose use layers of protection to protect your pool. And yeah, the idea was that uh, the the reason he kind of came up with it is he was tired of competing with swimming lessons and alarms and. You know, the idea was that if you had them all, you'd be a lot better off. And um, it's, it's kind of neat to see how it's taken off from his little little book that he wrote. And uh, it's, it's caught on, you know. He had tremendous foresight. And <laughs> really, the, the beauty of what our Safer 3 message is, it takes that, that concept. And we actually were inspired by Laurie Lawrence in Australia with his Kids Alive program. Mm -hmm. where he brought in that idea of layers of protection or uh, the multiple strategies that really are necessary because you never know which which element is going to make a difference. That's sort of the concept of the pool safety campaign too from the Consumer Product Safety Commission. But the Safer 3 is taking a very broad approach, looking at the idea of there always being risk. Right. And water, there is always some element of risk. The word safe, you know, gets thrown around a lot. My kids took swim lessons. They're pool safe now or they're water safe or water. I got I to gotta say, though, and I, I contribute this to you a lot. Uh, the water safety community, at least, has really backed off from the word safe and replaced it with safer to a big degree. I'm sure there's people that, you know, still use it here and there. But for the most part, the people in the drowning prevention community have all realized that the correct terminology is safer. And, you know, I, I give you, you know, most of the credit for that. You know, I think that came from Safer 3. Well, my brother from a different mother, Dave Dubois, and Australia, <laughs> together we really tried to lead the battle on that. And, you know, the word safe means that you're free from risk of injury or harm or death. Sure. And with water, 
it really is not the case. I mean, you can have a safe experience. I always compare it to the automobile industry and, you know, the fact that we live on, on wheels in America, that you can have a safe journey. We're going to drive to San Diego here after this, this call and hopefully we'll have a safe journey, meaning that there'll be no accidents involved. That right. doesn't mean there is not risk during that travel. So if people can understand first and foremost that with the water, there's always going to be some risk and you need to look for the risk. And what we did with the Safer 3 was to look at the, the elements that are common to every drowning. There's three common elements. There's always water. There's always a person, quite often a child, and there's always a response capability. So that kind of condensed down Lori Lawrence's do the five, fence the pool, shut the gate, teach your kids to swim. It's great. Super right. ball, watch them, right? Learn how to resuscitate. I love that. Uh, we brought it down to three that, you know, the the idea of water, where's the safer water? Where's the risk with the water? And you look for the risk in your home, the risk in your community, the risk when you travel. You have different bodies of water all around the world and lots of it. So just being able to broaden your understanding and perception of risk makes such a huge difference. You have the backyard pool, here's where the fencing comes in, and the alarms, and the gate latches, all these things. The barriers, though, are not going to help you when you're down at the beach. Now you need to understand some of the risks associated with open water, rip currents, high surf, water temperature. Every year there's victims of hypothermia that just didn't understand. So education is really what our foundation, which is now called Stop Drowning Now, um, is all about educating the public about the risks associated whenever you're in, on, or around the water. Why did you guys decide to change the name from Safer 3 to Stop Drowning Now? Well, Safer 3 was the first, the message. And right. we created that uh, in 19, or 2002 when I was president of the U.S. Swim School Association. And we were looking as part of our strategic plan to create a a national message for drowning prevention. Because as you know, there are so many different facets and different areas have different emphasis. So we came up with the idea of the safer three, as I explained about recognizing the risk, but it wasn't an organized foundation until 2004 when we incorporated and we were trying to make it part of the US Swim School Association, but it really was we had to separate it. We needed to be able to have it available for all organizations, all communities around the world. So we coined the phrase Swim for Life Foundation. And the message was still the Safer Three. And there was confusion. You know, well, are you Swim for Life or are you Safer Three? So a few years later, we decided to make the foundation name that of the program of the, the message, the Safer Three Water Safety Foundation. But a few years ago, our board decided to change the name to reflect more of the cause of what we're doing. Uh, Safer Three is a wonderful explanation of how you can formulate strategies depending on where you are anywhere in the world to take this global problem and reduce it to a local or even a familial level of prevention. And we came up with Stop Drowning Now based on a banner that we saw at Houston, at the mall at the Galleria in Houston, where we had our strategic planning meeting. It was for Stop Cancer Now for Children's Hospital there. And we thought, that's it. And so we made our third name change and Safer 3 is still the message. And we'll talk a little bit, hopefully, about the curriculum that we've been able to create and is about to launch within the next couple months. So yeah, a lot of exciting things have happened. So tell me about the curriculum. Go ahead. Well, we've been closely associated with the National Drowning Prevention Alliance. We've been one of the major sponsors from the beginning and invested a lot of our time and resources because we understand the value of bringing all these different organizations together. And the strength of the, the synergy and the energy of this diverse group is, is huge. Right. And, and, you, and you've been a board member and a, a past president and your, your wife is currently a board member and yeah. was the treasurer a few years ago. Oh, uh, it's just been a wonderful association. And, you know, we draw 
tremendous inspiration from the families united, those that have lost loved ones to drowning, and how they've turned their grief into advocacy and the efforts that they're making, and trying to bring everyone together with this unifying message of you know, we have to educate, but we also have to change the perception, the public perception of responsibility for prevention. And that, I think, is really the biggest challenge. But during my time with the NDPA board, we, uh, it was with the Virginia Graham Baker Full Safety Act was passed. And I know you had Scott Wilson on a few weeks ago and yeah. tremendous session with him, by the way. Thank you. Uh, He's fantastic. We were, the NDPA was awarded, a, I think, $1.2 million grant to create some educational programs. And I took the lead on developing a, a preschool curriculum that would really teach children about of the risk of drowning and do it in such a way that it would not just be a, a one simple single bullet silver bullet message right but rather a 10-hour course that would be taken in school and it was developed for pre-k through second grade and we launched it it was piloted great response but we found that it really was maybe a little bit above that grade level so we stopped drowning now the board put together a, a team. Actually, it was the sister of our president, Jim Spears, and one of her teaching friends in, in San Antonio, in Austin, rather, uh, San Antonio, that uh, put together the current version, which is some 223 pages, I believe, over 20 wow. hours, and very experiential. Experiential, the kids are not just being told they are doing it while they learn and a lot of take home materials. It's still for pre-K through second grade. And we've actually condensed it down to where there's also a one week version, a five hour that could be used in schools or in the organization, park and rec program, summer programs, homeschooling, but it could be a safety week. And also for those that just are looking for an assembly, taking the same concepts of the safer three in down to a, a safety day. So the challenges we encountered across the country were some school districts are very <laughs> high tech, like where I live here in Southern California, sure. our school district, they have to have a program that the kindergartners can put into their iPads and right. not overwhelm the teachers with the workload that so many of them have. But then there's other schools that are happy to have the hard copy, the binder with all the materials and print up the activities that they have. So we've invested, you know, nearly $80,000 into an upgrade, which will not only put the, the curriculum into a platform that can be used electronically, any version that they really need. The company that's doing this will incorporate, redo our whole website. So it's just going to be an amazing tool for educators, for families, for anyone that's working in, in water safety. And again, for this particular age group. And this is something that Blake Collingsworth from the Joshua Collingsworth Foundation has been crusading for years is that we have to have the generational approach to educating not just the parents, but we start with the kids. Right. And it's not just one assembly, but it's over and over again, you know, from pre-K, Again, in kindergarten, hearing the same message with a little bit more information each year that we're going to have a generation then of people that have grown up understanding that there's always risk whenever you're in on around the water and that safe can become unsafe in a heartbeat, which I think is something that most people tend to ignore, not ignore, but not dwell on. They don't want to think about the possibility of losing a loved one. So realizing that there is risk looking at the ways that they can reduce that risk using a formula like the safer three where you look for the risk with the water in your lives the people in your lives and then the response capability that you possess then you can create a, a personal family recipe for prevention that makes more sense for someone in in south florida than for someone in lincoln nebraska or someone in Portland, Oregon, or Da Nang, South Vietnam. The risks are the same. There's always risk. 
I shouldn't say they're the same. They come in different forms, but it's the same basic overall elements that are going to be there. I get yeah. long with sometimes, Eric. Sorry. No, you're perfect. That's that's great, and uh, and I agree 100. percent And I love the generational approach. You know, anybody who has kids, um, you know, has been reminded to put their seatbelt on by their five year old, right? Absolutely. Um, you know, I remember coming home after learning about you know, uh, energy conservation and the environment and, you know, making sure my mom turned the lights off in rooms we weren't in, right? You know, and uh, you know, so, you know, kids are instrumental in getting parents to adopt these safety things and kind and of educating the parents. Grandpa, the grandparents. <laughs> yeah, exactly, right? Um, I, I had someone on the, the show the other day talking about, um, they had done a thing about drinking and driving in his kid's class and, you know, he was on his way to a barbecue and picked up a six pack from the, you know, whatever, and didn't, wasn't going to drink it. He had it, you know, in the backseat or whatever. And his daughter was like, oh no, you can't. And he was like, no, no, I'm, we're not drinking it. I'm just driving it to the, the barbecue. It's fine. You know, but, uh, yeah. but yeah, kids, kids get it. And, you know, I think that generational approach is, you know, the only way. So that way when they grow up, they become, it's ingrained, right? It's absolutely. You know, Educate to eliminate. That's yeah. the slogan of the Stop Drowning Now Foundation. And part of that education, like we said, is the generational approach. The kids will learn it. They will share it with their parents, hopefully. And many of the activities require parental involvement. For example, a, a scavenger hunt in the home looking for things that have potential risk. Mm -hmm. and it's just a wonderful, wonderful program. And we're extremely excited about trying to get uh, schools across the country involved. There's several pilot programs that are going to take it on now, and we're just extremely excited. I mean, in your lifetime, you can remember, I'm sure, cars without seatbelts, you know. Absolutely. And, right, for a long time. And, yeah. you know, but a lot of people growing up today couldn't imagine a car without a seatbelt. They would think it was something wrong with it. They would be really um, thrown off. And, you know, I, I have the hope that, you know, a a pool without some kind of fence around it or a barrier or alarms has the same kind of visceral reaction to, to kids, uh, future adults, eventually as a car without a seatbelt does now, you know, that it just becomes so normal yep. that, you know, if a pool doesn't have a fence and there's something really wrong, you know, why, why doesn't your pool have a fence around it? Um, if you're going to have a pool, you better know how to swim. <laughs> yeah, exactly. 100%, right? So each one of these elements, Eric, you know, we're on the same page. Mm -hmm. Every pool should have a fence. Every child, every person should know how to swim. Yeah. Should have the personal skills to preserve their life in the water and, and enjoy the wonderful benefits of, of that the water brings to our lives. And, but understand that it, it, with that ability comes the responsibility to reduce the risk. And then the safer response too, right? The CPR. Uh, what else do you include in safer response besides CPR? Well, it's something as simple as <clears throat> the 911 protocol. Okay. And funny story here, one of our friends, Andy Broido in South Florida was doing a little <laughs> session with some four-year-olds. And this is when cell phones were just coming on in their popularity. And they had a, a, a simulated pool with a, a blue tarp and that if Susie fell in the pool, what would we do? And someone said, call for help. And then she said, how about the phone? And the little girl said, dial 911, press send. <laughs> so yes, the, the times have changed a little bit, but safer response would be the preparedness and the ability to react in case of an emergency. Uh, knowing who to call, as far as emergency, our professional emergency responders, knowing rescue techniques, uh, there's always the debate on the reach, throw, don't go concept with older children, older siblings, for example, a seven or eight year old, should they jump in the three foot part of the pool to rescue the 18 month old sibling? You know, you can say, no, they shouldn't, they should call for the parents, but if, you know, you've got a seven or eight year old that's right swimmer and can stand up there then certainly they should go in after them but it's always a matter of finding the safest way 
to respond to the, the emergency. So the reach, throw, don't go concept is part yeah, of it. And you try and tell a dad who's watching his kid drown in the ocean not to go swim for him. I mean, that's... That's right. That's something you know. a professional's got to do. But the parental yeah. instincts, we see it every year. It's such a tragedy. Yeah. But that goes back to, you know, having the personal skills to preserve your life and those of your loved ones in the water. We're not all going to be professional lifeguards, but, you know, you've got to know your limits. The understanding of, of rules, you know, that's part of, you know, pool ownership. And if you're going to go to the water, understand the risks, understand the safety precautions that should be there and respond accordingly. So it's not just responding to the emergency. It's responding to the situation you're faced with and understanding where the risks are and what you're going to do to, to have a safer experience. No, it makes it makes a lot of sense. And um you know, it is hard to tell someone not to go after their kid, right? I mean, that's for sure. And and you wonder how effective that messaging is, right? In a real life scenario, you know, you know, maybe he intellectually knows that he shouldn't do this, but you know, is is he going to sit there and watch, you know, his nephew drown in a pool? I mean, or in an ocean? You know, it's a tough call. You know. Yeah. So uh, that's. It was so interesting. One of our NDPA conferences years ago, the keynote speaker uh, was talking about the diversity in the audience and the, the energy that that synergy of diversity brings to the, the effort of water safety. And she actually contacted a numerologist to try to calculate the possible number of factors that could go into a drowning anywhere in the world at any point in time. And the number she came up with was 12 million. That if you think about it, I mean, this is everything from time of day, did, when was their last meal, you know, swimming ability, everything. But how do you craft a, a drowning prevention message? Right. The audience, what are you going to tell them for that many factors? And that's part of the, the beauty of the National Drowning Prevention Alliance is that you've got that diversity. However, it's also one of the greatest challenges of that organization to bring everybody together. And, you know, I've used the analogy of everyone's shining a flashlight in the dark, trying to find the, the safety messages and that they're all going different directions. You've got wear life jackets, learn CPR, put up fences, learn to swim. All these different things are separate messages. Well, I thought, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could get them all focused like a lighthouse, be a lighthouse beacon? Our Stop Drowning Now president, Jim Spear, came up with the analogy that we're all in the same competitive swimming pool, but each in a different lane, but we're all going in the same direction. So that's part of you know what the NDPA is all about, bringing safety messages together. And again, that's where we feel that the Safer 3 message offers a formula that deals with the overall broad picture of recognizing risk and coming up with ways to recognize the resources that are available to reduce that risk, whether you're dealing with open bodies of water, closed bodies like a backyard pool or spa, bathtubs in the home, buckets, everything. It's about the risk, taking this global problem and bringing it down to the local level where prevention has to be addressed and we're making headway. That, that makes so much sense. I mean, you really, I, I can't think of a, a better way to address it holistically than, than that, you know, it, it makes a lot of sense. So, I mean, you started swimming at Blue Buoy at 11, you said, right? Did you know as a kid that that's what you wanted to do? That you wanted to, Well, was, that, was that your plan? Two years from that, my dad was in the Marine Corps. So my first swimming experience was at the Marine Corps Air Station El Toro. Okay longer in existence, but that was in 1953, right. with about 20 other five-year-olds <clears throat> excuse me, hanging on the side of that frigid pool, no pool heater, with the Marines on the deck with bamboo poles, and they would just guide us around and shake us off and kick, kick, kick back to the side. But uh, I had very limited swimming experience because we moved from California right after that to Massachusetts. And I think I was in a swimming pool two different times in four years, but my swimming was at Lake Poketapog in Connecticut. But when we came back to California, I took a Red Cross program, in the city of Santa Ana, and then my mom got me into Blue Boy where I started on the little swim team. 
So I had no aspirations of being a champion swimmer or devoting a life to aquatics. I wanted to play golf. I was in the junior golf association, but mom kept making me swim. So thank you, mom. I appreciate it. You've given me a lifelong passion and an uh, incredible chance to, to help people around the world even. So hats off to you. We lost mom four years ago, but uh, she loved swimming and just loved, she loved golf too. But I've been, uh, like I said, teaching for 51 years now and we've, experienced a lot of benefits through that uh, association of swim schools and water safety groups. We've traveled the world, seen a lot of different methodologies and philosophies, but all people with the same passion. And that's part of what we're going to be doing in Australia in a couple of weeks, just bringing together all these leaders in the, the industry, if you will, and sharing and trying to come up with ways that can, you know, help reduce the drownings. So so talk about your, your competitive career for a while, because I, I know you did competitive swimming and I know that you, you did pretty well, uh, but I, I don't know too much about it and I, I always wanted to, so. Well, I was fortunate to swim with uh, Mel and Doris Maxwell at Blue Boy for a year. And then my dad had been overseas at that time. When he came home, we moved to San Diego and I was introduced to the Copley YMCA where my coach there was a young Marine from the Marine Corps recruit depot. And it was his first USA swimming or AAU club. And he's gone on to be a hall of fame, uh, swim coach, Jack Simon. Oh, wow. Okay. Jack, listening to this, how you doing buddy? <laughs> Jack is uh, a wonderful man and he's living in Mexico now, but he has traveled the world, you know, helping establish competitive programs. I was not one of his champion swimmers. In fact, I used the line that Jack would say, there goes Johnny. He may be small, but he sure is slow. <laughs> I never broke a minute in the 100 free, and but I have the distinction of one of my students holding the fastest time in history for the 100 meter freestyle, Jason Lezak in the Beijing. An incredible four by 100 freestyle relay swim that he chased down Alain Bernard from France to bring gold back to the United States. So it's been a wonderful time. I enjoyed my six years, swam in high school in Hawaii <clears throat> at Radford High School for three years and also ran track, but enjoyed swimming, but it was not a passion. And it was when I started teaching that I truly found something that was fun. I was pretty good at and 52 years now, or I'm into my 52nd year, I think I said, and it's just so wonderful that something that brings you such joy and validation for what you're doing can become a, a, a decade long profession. So, when did you, when know, did you know, that know that this is what you, is wanted, what you to wanted to do? I'm not sure. I, we just rolled with it. Cindy and I were married when we we're both pretty young and it was just something I did in the summers and I taught scuba for a couple of years. And after a while, Mel realized that, you know, I needed to expand my hours. So three months, four months turned into six. I was coaching a swim team at Blue Boy at the time and not doing a lot of lessons, but it eventually evolved into more year round work. And we bought into the, the business the hours expanded to where, you know, it's been full time for many, many years now. And I still love going to work. I was in the water yesterday and it's just a amazing thing. And you've seen a lot of my Facebook posts with the children. I've been blessed to be able to work with and the adults. So it's, it's really fun. I've had the opportunity to coach high school swimming, both my boys uh, coached for almost 15 years at Villa Park high school, both swimming and water polo. Coached age group programs, SoCal Aquatics in the 70s, and a couple smaller clubs. And I've been truly blessed with being able to work at all the different levels from teaching not only the children, but teaching teachers. Uh, we've worked with special abilities children. Uh, we've worked with underprivileged. We have a program that we're doing right now with the uh, Orange County Rescue Mission children from their, their village of hope where we 
donated some pool time, our staff, and we partner with the local assistance league and their teen program, the assist teens, where these middle school and high school uh, boys and girls are giving their community service hours and we're teaching them how to teach these kids that may have never had the opportunity for swim lessons. So, and that was the program that we were able to start five years ago when Princess Charlene of Monaco looked us up and she was coming to California for an event and she had a experience with a, a city in Africa, North Africa, where there had been some drownings and she wanted, she has a drowning prevention foundation as well. Wow. Wow. And, no, 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 no. and as a uh, Olympic swimmer from South Africa, she competed in the Sydney Olympics in 2000, but she's created an incredible array of ambassadors, including Dara Torres, who was familiar with Blue Boy. And at any rate, they reached out to us and we thought, wow, is this for real? And sure enough, it was. And we wound up bringing in the, the children from the Village of Hope. And Princess Charlene did a, a lesson with them, with she and Dara and our staff. And then we incorporated that into our Safer Three Water Safety Challenge, which is one of the events that uh, our foundation has created and we've had tremendous success with other organizations uh, hosting these. This is uh, an opportunity for aquatic facilities to host an event where the community can come in and basically it's a chance to assess the family's abilities with water safety and following most of the safer three elements. Can the children demonstrate the ability if they fell in the pool to recover their balance and get back to the side of the pool unassisted, either fully clothed or in swim suits? Uh, can they float on their back for at least 30 seconds? Can they swim short distances from 20 feet across a small pool like ours at the swim school to distances of up to a mile? Can they tread water? Can they demonstrate how to swim in a life jacket that has been shown how to be properly fitted? Can they demonstrate reach, throw, don't go? And can they demonstrate CPR, which are all stations during our safety challenge? And this is an event that uh, we just hosted uh, last month or in April at Blue Boy. And it's a wonderful opportunity for schools. And if anybody's interested, they can go on our website, stopdrowningnow.org and look up events and water safety challenge with a whole packet of information on how to plan one. And it's like our curriculum where you can do the, the full spectrum that we try to do at Blue Boy, or you can condense it down and just use elements of it. But these are all skills that are typically taught in any learn to swim program, the ability to get back to the side, to float and to swim. And drowning is the inability to breathe in water or some liquid and learning to swim with the ability to recover the breath is something that we're all teaching. So it's a great way to, to package it and involve the community, uh, local fire departments, any other water safety groups. We brought in fencing companies demonstrating that barriers are a, a, a big part of water safety as well. So anyway, where were we? <laughs> how, how, how old do you think, you think someone, someone should be to start, start lessons? lessons? Well, this is a, a question that's been bandied around for, for many decades. I, I know it's a trap. I'm sorry. No, that's okay. No, uh, Our personal view is that if you can get a child into the water before they learn to walk, you can begin establishing a foundation that will allow them to develop the skills to preserve their life in the water. We place a high premium on being able to enjoy their life in the water. So we're talking about the emotional side of you know the amount of stress or anxiety that a child may encounter in the lessons and then to be able to give them the, the skills to reach their full potential as an athlete and if you read through our little bio we've had eight students that have become olympians throughout the the decades four in water polo four in swimming and another that held the world record for the english channel swim for 11 years so that not being our goal Teaching children, you know, 
to live in the water. You often hear about survival lessons that, you know, certainly the ability to preserve life in the water is paramount. But there's a whole broad interpretation of the word survival. And we have taken a very, what we consider developmental approach at Blue Boy to developing this foundation. And we compare it to the way a, a young child is developing on land in the first three years of their life, where 90% of their brain development is taking place. And the amount of stress that these children are subjected to in any facet of their life definitely affects the memory processing and how their personality can be altered because of that amount of stress. The uh, amount of nurturing that they receive as an infant. There was a very interesting study done when there was a, a large influx of orphans coming from Eastern European and from the, from the Asian countries that these babies had never had physical contact. They were always left in their little incubator, cribs, whatever, very minimal physical contact. And the families that adopted these children found there was really a strong challenge for them to get these kids to trust and to interact with other children and basically develop in what we would consider, a, you know, a normal, well-rounded personality. So stress, no matter whether it's chronic minor stress or uh, traumatic event type stress impacts the brain development. So again, back to the, the developing the ability to live in the water, we want them to have, again, the personal skills, the water safety skills, but we feel that they're inherent in how the, the skills are developed or how children learn to swim. Uh, like I said, the ability to breathe is huge. We teach the children to have a foundation of breath control, which allows them to get underwater, balance control, which is really the, the biggest element to consider, and then finally, how they move, okay? Much like a baby learning to crawl on land, there's you know six months getting ready to crawl, pushing, but basically the child is opposing gravity. And in that, process, they learn to move in certain ways where they can maintain equilibrium, leading to the ability to stand. And now they have a whole new system of equilibrium control based on a center of gravity, having their head above their feet and their hips above their feet. And when they can control that line of balance, then the whole spectrum of movement that becomes our life on land evolves, running, climbing, jumping, all the things we can do, all the activities, all stem from that foundation of balance control in the vertical plane. When we bring a child into the water, now it's a little bit different. Because our bodies are 70% water, whatever's below the surface only weighs about 10% of what it does on land. But that part of the body that is above the surface is exposed to 100% gravity influence. So it has the full weight. So the brain is being subjected to a, a whole new set of stimuli that the, they have no background, no response for. So it's a process where they've got to be exposed to it gradually. And if a child is just carried around the pool and never allowed to go under, they're never going to experience that complete weightless effect of getting below the surface where that 10% of body weight basically is erased because of the air in the lungs. So we're really looking at three areas of balance and I <laughs> don't want to run off here, but it, uh, you have land balance, you have buoyancy balance, and then you have the combination of both, which we encounter at the surface where it's a bobbing balance. Part of the body is above under the influence of gravity. Whatever's below is under the influence of buoyancy. So if we can get a child comfortable going underwater, holding their breath, and breath control is quite a bit different in the water than it is on land. Yeah. Right now you're breathing in and out through your nose. I'm breathing in and out through my mouth because I'm talking. But in the water, you have to have a blended control. There's times when you will actually hold your breath, which is early on, and then 
you learn to exchange the air, but not in and out through the nose like we do right now, but out through the nose whenever you pass through the surface, in through the mouth. This is one of the biggest challenges for my nervous, frightened adults that come in. They've never learned to, to blow bubbles out of their nose. And it's as simple as humming. Um, that sound is air. And in the water, it turns into bubbles. And those bubbles prevent water from going into your nose and causing the discomfort that so many uh, adults have experienced. But the breath control allows us to get the child underwater where the brain begins to assimilate all these experiences. And that's what I think many programs, either because they don't have the opportunity to teach year round or they just don't understand the principle of sensory integration, which is the assimilation of the experience. And learning to swim is sensory integration. As a developing infant, they're like little sponges. Everything they experience is being imprinted. And the more positive, the more enjoyable, the experience, the greater the, the neural pathway being created is, and that becomes a learned experience. This is where the question of how much stress they should be subjected to comes into play because if they get you know, too much stress, the body releases the emergency, and the, the amygdala part of the brain, that organ that's part of our survival, our freeze, fight, or flight syndromes, we see the production of cortisol and adrenaline that puts us into high alert for, for dealing with the emergency that's coming up. And that compromises that development of the neural pathways. It can actually break down some of them. Lana Whitehead from Tempe, Arizona and Swim Kids there has written a couple books on movement and child development and the effects of stress in all their development. But uh, it's just a, a subject that I hope will see more attention, not so much the age of when children start, but, you know, how they're being subjected to the instruction. And it shouldn't be like outward bound for adults, you know, learning to survive. It should be learning to live. And the water safety is still the single most important part of it, but it can be accomplished with uh, enjoyable, uh, positive reinforcement and teaching a child to trust not only the teacher but themselves in the water and learning that there is risk and they learn how to, to deal with that risk but in a manner that you might use in the home too how do you teach a child to negotiate stairs at nine months when they first started crawling and you just help them the way they scoot down the stairs it's all about reducing the risk through uh a manner that will you know, not endanger the child, either mentally, uh, physically, or emotionally. So, but uh, the age, you know, we love to see kids begin, you know, anywhere from three months to six months. We like to, to have the, the neck strength to support the head in the water. But we've had some family members and some of our teachers that, you know, have actually had the child in the water. The youngest is my good friend, uh, Jim Turner from uh, the Newport Beach Lifeguards. He was a battalion chief for years. He's now working at Lake Mission Viejo. But I taught Jim's wife to swim back in the 60s and all four of their children, their youngest daughter, Maddie, got in the water with me when she was three days old. So <laughs> she's wow, my wow. youngest. <laughs> but, you know, that's not formal lessons. But it's it's a return to the womb. And if it's done in warm water, in a fairly quiet, calm situation, you know, these kids can be introduced to the water. And the, the beautiful thing about starting before they learn to walk is that you afford them the opportunity to have a parallel development taking place. Their life on land, where they're learning to move independently, opposing gravity, and their life in the water, where they're learning the differences between controlling themselves at the interface, the surface where gravity and buoyancy meet, and below the surface when they're weightless. And that is truly a return to the womb. The, developmentally, the benefits are huge. They have physical benefits of uh, working against more resistance. The hydrostatic pressure of the water gives them this tactile stimulation that they can't receive on land. 
moving against resistance increases muscle tone, the pressure of the water increases circulation, and being in the buoyant state is giving their brain this dual perception of balance. And it's just amazing. The study in Griffith University in Australia shows that there's higher intelligence in children that have begun swim lessons early. That's really cool. I've never heard this concept of, you know, the the, uh, the buoyant and non-buoyant, the dual balance. It's, it's really fascinating stuff, you know. Well, I had the benefit of, again, being mentored by Mel Maxwell, who was always thinking outside the box, if you will. But <laughs> I like to think that he was inside, inside the pool. Box, but he was exploring every facet of that box. And, right. Uh, his philosophy was that we're going to meet the individual needs of every child and that Blue Boy was one of the first programs that took the large group type setting that you typically found in Learn to Swim with school age kids and started bringing it down to lower ages. But we had, I'm pretty sure Mel said we were one of the first warm water pools, you know, over 90 degrees. And, you know, that's just the norm now, you know, 88 to 92, 93 degrees, depending on ambient temperature. Uh, is what's necessary for working with infants and toddlers in a truly optimal setting. Right. We lose body heat in 80 degree water at the same rate we do in 40 degree air temperature. So unless you're very active, an 80 degree heated pool is very cold. So sure. it's uh, there's a lot to it. But, you know, I've been blessed by working with a lot of very influential and knowledgeable people and uh, I never stop learning. I try to learn something new every day. What should uh, what should a parent look for if they're going to choose a swim school? Cleanliness, uh, the atmosphere, and is it family oriented? Is it cold and too business like? You know, are, are children crying? Why are they crying? Are they laughing? Why are they laughing? You know, <laughs> so it's like any parental. Uh, decision making. It needs to get into the, the limbic system of the brain, which is also part of the drowning prevention messaging, but uh, it needs to feel right. And you can make decisions based on location, on price, on convenience of scheduling, but you've got to have a, a good gut feeling that this is some place where you you're, feel your child is going to be safe and have a safer learning experience. But uh, everyone will make their own decision. You know, there are what I consider very aggressive programs that I cannot, you know, we choose a different path. But the parents will make the, the final decision. And again, you know, we have encountered families that have lost loved ones and they will do anything to see that from happening to, you know, other siblings that they may have, other children. Yet we've had families in our program that have lost children and they've chosen to take the path where they want their child to not only have the skills that will preserve their life in the water, but they want them to live in the water, enjoy that water and learn the responsibility. So again, it's a personal decision made by every family and I will never try to you know, point one way or the other, other than saying, look at what's out there and don't just rush to judgment. You know, there are a lot of ways to teach children to swim and not every child is the same. Like Mel said, you meet the individual needs of each child because everyone is hardwired differently and you'll have cautious children that really need a very soft approach, longer lasting, or where they can build their confidence. And you've got other hard chargers that, you know, are going to be your X game athletes and they can handle anything. So it's a very personal decision, but I think parents need to understand that there is a, a wide spectrum of opportunities to learn to swim, not a, in every community. So that's another, another <laughs> consideration. Are there any red flags to look out for of things that if you see, you know, X, Y, Z, you know, watch out. Well, you know, personally, I just, you can get quick results with children that are, you know, maybe over the age of four. Okay. And 
they can handle a little more stress, but I still don't think they should be subjected to it, but they can learn in a, a quicker format. So the programs that say we're going to teach your child to swim in, you know, three easy swim lessons or one week or whatever. If that's a toddler, that I, I just don't think is going to happen. Not to what we consider, you know, the optimal goal of teaching a child to truly love the water, to trust themselves in the water, but to respect the water. And if it's just a, a knee jerk reflex that they're being conditioned to and there's too much stress involved, that's, you know, detrimental to the child's neurological development, their emotional development, and they may learn to, you know, struggle across the pool or flip over on their back. You know, that doesn't matter. It's the ability to control their balance and their breathing and movement in the water in a emotional state that's calm and, and trusting. If it's all a, a struggle, it, it's, I don't know, it's like putting an adult on roller skates for the first time on a boat and <laughs> saying, go. Oh. Right. Uh, foundation building, particularly with children under the age of three, is just such an incredible opportunity to enhance their lives. And, you know, we never lose track of the importance of safety and drowning prevention, believe me. And yet, I know the joy that skill in the water can bring to, to families and the confidence and the physical benefits are huge. So I just hate to see a child lose that opportunity. And the red flags will come from the limbic system in each parent's brain. If they are not comfortable with what they see, and there's an opportunity to visit somewhere else, they should, should certainly take that and then weigh the differences and where they feel most comfortable. Absolutely. It, um, man, we're, we've been, time flies when you're having fun and I know you need to get to San Diego. Is there anything you wanna, um, one last thing you wanna let people know before we, uh, we wrap this up? Well, as far as water safety, uh, you know, I mentioned that the generational approach is huge, but changing the status quo, understanding of their responsibility for drowning prevention. That's the other challenge. I always 100%. say that with Stop Drowning Now, we're trying to basically conduct a two-pronged attack. You know, the generational approach where we're involving families, but also changing the way people believe their role and, re and responsibilities are for water safety. And I would just like to recommend a gentleman called Simon Sinek, S-I-N-E-K. I know Simon Sinek, start with Y. Yep, start with the Y. And this is back to the limbic system. You know, he believes that decisions are made, whether it's to buy a product, to enroll a child in a particular activity, should be based on, does it feel right? Is it something that, you know, they can believe in if they're just looking at the, the what the, the price the the options on the the computer or the car you know they may not make the decision based on those but it's got to feel right and it's got to really make a difference but read the book and there is a ted talk with simon sinek on start with the why yep. this was the epiphany that i had with trying to get people to realize number one there is risk Yes, it can happen to them. We come up with the phrase, safe can become unsafe in a heartbeat. That's what most people don't realize. Uh, so many of the drowning events that happen, the first thing the parents say, we never thought it would ever happen to us until we became you know, the other people that we'd always thought it happened to. So if you understand that there is risk, then you are more receptive to the messaging that's out there, whether it's, you know, the pool safely campaign where you're going to deal with backyard pools or the broader approach of the safer three message where you're looking for the risk. And instead of having someone tell you, here's your safety tips that you'll say, yeah, I understand those, but not do anything, have them grasp the, the reality that, wow, this could be us. And then asking, what can we do to keep this from happening to us? Then look for the resources that are already out there. It's not rocket science. It's just bringing it together in a simple message and 
realizing that this is important, important enough to make changes in our life, in our behavior. Put up that fence, learn to swim, take those CPR lessons, wear that life jacket. Anyway, Eric, thank you so much for this opportunity. I just have so much respect for what you're doing and appreciate this opportunity. Yeah, and it's a great book recommendation, by the way. I love that book. I've read it. Um, I saw the TED Talk. Yeah, it's a, it's a good one for sure. We got to meet him sometime and get him to do a talk. I would. Oh, that'd be great. Yeah, he's he's awesome. You know, I, I'm a big fan of his. So that'd be that'd be really cool. All right. Well, thanks, Johnny. Enjoy your trip to San Diego. Drive safely. As I hope you have a safer yeah, trip to San Diego trip as possible. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, Eric. All right. Thanks, Johnny. Have a good one, man. Bye.